Fractured rock aquifers are important worldwide, so it's important to understand the role that fractures play in hydrogeologic processes. Fractures are complicated things. The real fractures like this one have uh, parts that are open and they have parts that are in contact. You can see right here and right there that the fracture walls are actually in contact. But when we think about fractures, we typically idealize them as two parallel plates that are held open by a certain gap or aperture. So this is the idealized conceptualization of what a fracture looks like. There are these two plates and water is flowing between these plates. So the aperture is an important characteristic of fractures. Here we have uh, a, f a set of fractures that are intersecting and we have a hydraulic head gradient imposed on them. So if we're interested in flow through this material, then we're interested in the aperture of the fractures. That's going to be one of the, the fundamental characteristics. And typically in fractures in the subsurface, um, the apertures are in the range of tens to hundreds of microns. Uh, one millimeter is equal to a thousand microns, so fractures of tenths of a millimeter are um, fairly typical for, for fairly conductive fractures. Just for reference, a piece of paper is about 75 microns thick. So fractures don't occur just uh, as isolated entities. Typically there are multiple fractures and the fracture density is a way to characterize how many fractures there are in a unit volume. So fracture, can, fracture density can be thought of in several different ways. If you, if you conceptualize a fracture as, uh, as a being a break that has a, a certain surface area, then the fracture, the total surface area of a fracture in a given volume is one measure of a fracture density, but there are other measures that we'll see in, in just a second on the next slide. Also an important aspect is how well the fractures that exist in the subsurface are connected to their neighbors. If the fractures are isolated from their neighbors, then water could flow through an individual fracture, but it's hard to make a long traverse because the fractures would have to, the, fracture, the water would have to go from one fracture to the next, and if the fractures are not connected, then that can require going through low permeability rock. But if individual fractures are connected to their neighbors, then there can be a through-going pathway and we can see that here. This would be the through-going pathway uh, formed by connected fractures. And when you have fractures that are connected uh, and form this pathway, that's called a percolating network because the water can percolate from one side of the network to another. We'll also be interested in what is filling the fractures. In some cases, fractures are breaks in rock that are just open and uh, f and there's a gap through which water can flow. Uh, in other cases though there have been minerals that have formed after the fracture has been created and these mineral precipitates can fill the fractures and in an extreme case fractures may be completely filled with mineral precipitates and you would then have a vein. Okay so let's take a look at fracture networks and the fracture density concept in a little more detail. So here's, here's our fracture, um, here's a fracture network in an idealized, or in, in kind of a general way, but if we idealize this like this, so we have multiple fractures and the black lines are the fractures. And in some settings you have fracture sets that are sub-parallel. So one way to describe the fracture density would be if we were to take a traverse through these fractures and um, this would be say it could be a borehole uh, that we drill down through these fractures or in some way we sample along a line and if we measure the number of fractures this in this case there would be four fractures um, along this length uh, 
then we could characterize the fracture density as the number of fractures per unit length that you encounter along that line. So that's what I'm implying here. Fracture density as number of fractures per length. But we could also imagine that there was an outcrop and the fractures were exposed as, as traces along this outcrop. And so let's say, for example, that this is a map of a, uh, a horizontal surface where some fractures are exposed. Then we could characterize the fracture density by taking this area, the square block, and then we see these fracture traces. We could measure the lengths of the fracture traces and then add them up and divide by the area. So that would be this measure of fracture density. The total trace length of the fractures per unit area exposed in an outcrop, for example. And then another way to think about it is to recognize that if you have just a single isolated fracture, at least in some cases where fractures have been um, have been exposed in mines and people have been able to map them in 3D, um, also in experiments, what people find is that individual fractures are often shaped roughly as a circular feature. They're broken over this circular region. And so if you think about that, it's a it's a circular region. It's got some finite length. And we could have a 3D volume here, 3D block. And within that 3D block, there would be these fractures that are like, the, like circular disks. So an individual fracture, in this case, we could characterize as having a certain surface area. There's the surface area for that one. There's this one and so on. And so we could measure the fracture density by the surface area that occurs within this volume of rock. Now, it's typically quite difficult to measure this surface area because it's hard to see the fracture over that much of, uh, of an extent. It's easier to do this, but even this requires there there's, to be an outcrop. It's much easier to do this where you have a borehole that's drilled down through the fractures and you can see them on the wall of the, the borehole with a camera, for example. And so we have this as a third measure of the fracture density. That's this 3D case. Note that all three of these versions, this would be a, an area per volume. This one would be a length per area. All of these have units of 1 over length, and they're all measures of fracture density. Now, what is generally assumed is that this measure of fracture density in, in 3D, in this case, can be estimated by, by taking a 1D sample. So you could take this measure of uh, fracture spacing or fracture density um, in 1D, and that gives you a, an estimate of what the fracture density is in 3D. There may be ways to characterize or to uh, correct for it for certain fracture geometries, but in general, these are these are rough enough measurements typically. So, what's often done is to just is measure it in 1D and use that value as an estimate of fracture density in 3D. So that's one way to characterize a fracture network as the fracture density. And I should also point out that fracture density is 1 over the average spacing, the average distance between fractures when you're thinking about it in this one-dimensional uh, conceptual model like this. OK, so in this case, right there, from there to there, that would be the average spacing. And so the fracture density is 1 over that distance. Another thing that's useful is the porosity of a fractured system. And in crystalline rock, the porosity of the rock itself is very low. And so the porosity of the fractures can, can be an important contribution. It, can, it could dominate the porosity, the total porosity of the rock. 
And in any case, it could be an important contribution. And so we can estimate what the porosity is by uh, taking the, the fracture aperture, delta, uh, multiply that by the fracture density, and that's an estimate of the porosity of the fractures in the rock. Okay, so flow through fractures. Well, we have a characterization or an idealized concept of what fractures are like as uh, these two parallel plates. And so flow going through a fracture, we conceptualize as being similar to flow through these two parallel plates. We well, can look up your um, in your fluid mechanics book and get that the flow, the flux between two parallel plates is equal to the velocity, the average velocity, and that is given by this equation. So delta, that's the aperture. This is the density, fracture density, and that's the unit weight and the viscosity of water, and that's the head gradient. Actually, your fluid mechanics book probably doesn't have this equation per se, because it wouldn't have that term there, the fracture density. But nevertheless, it would have the flow through a single um, conduit that was formed from parallel plates. And this is the extension to a fracture system where there is a or fractures represented by uh, this fracture density. And so what we see from this is that the, let's see, there is that this looks a lot like Darcy's law. So right there, that looks like Darcy's law, or looks like hydraulic conductivity. So if we were to replace that with K, then we would have Darcy's law. So this thing right here is an effective hydraulic conductivity for a set of fractures that are represented by these parallel plates. So what this means is that if we have a region that is relatively large compared to the fracture spacing, um, then we can use Darcy's law to characterize flow through this region. On the previous slide, we saw that an effective hydraulic conductivity looks like this. The, the hydraulic conductivity is equal to the aperture cubed and the fracture density and then this stuff here that's the properties of the, the water. So what we can do then is solve for the aperture here. And I've done that down here. So this is giving us the, um, the what's a, really an effective aperture for a porous material that has this conductivity and this fracture density. So this allows us to estimate the what's called the effective hydraulic aperture. And in general, the hydraulic aperture is a bit smaller than the actual aperture because there's um, wall roughness and there's also a good bit of the fracture that is typically not in contact. So the average aperture, the average hydraulic aperture is assuming that the whole fracture is at a particular aperture. And if some of it is actually in contact, it has zero aperture. So we're kind of averaging out those areas. So if we can measure the hydraulic conductivity, then we can estimate, well, if we can measure the hydraulic conductivity and the fracture density, then we can estimate the average um, hydraulic aperture of the fractures. So we have a way of doing that. We can measure hydraulic conductivity independently using a slug or a pumping test. We can measure the fracture density or at least estimate it using a camera survey. So if we take these data here, we can then use this calculation to estimate what the effective hydraulic aperture of the fractures is. And, and assuming, uh, well, implicit in this is that all of the fractures that you recognize and are using to estimate the fracture density, they're all the same, they're all identical. And so you're assuming then that you have these fractures um, at a certain density and all of them have the same hydraulic aperture. Okay, so we're also interested in how rapidly water moves through fractures, the 
average velocity and the travel time. So we've seen that the average velocity through a porous media is equal to the flux divided by the porosity. And we saw also on the previous slide that the porosity of a fractured medium from the, the porosity that is from the fractures can be estimated as the fracture aperture divided by the fracture density. So as a result of that, we can just, we could say this, that the average velocity is equal to the conductivity and these guys here that are representing the average porosity. So we can go and substitute in using the um, effective hydraulic aperture and we can get this as an estimate of the velocity. We're also interested in the travel time of the water. That can be estimated by taking the distance of the travel and dividing it by the velocity of the travel. So that's given here. This is the velocity. So you can use this as a way of estimating how long it might take for water to go from one point to another. Now it's tempting to also think of contaminants moving that fast, and in some cases they may. But contaminants also can interact with the matrix the rock that forms the wall of the fractures, and that interaction will cause contaminants to move slower than the water. You might think of the velocity as an upper limit for the velocity of, of contaminants. Uh, and we might think of this time then as the lower limit of the time that it takes to, to travel from one point to another. But nevertheless, this ends up giving us a conservative estimate. We're concerned about whether contaminants might have arrived at a certain point. This would give us a way to, to have a conservative estimate uh, as to whether that might actually happen. Let's do an example. Let's say that we have these characteristics. How long would it take for water to travel 300 meters? So go ahead and try working that out. 